Hello, how are you doing? Gareth Bale's bored. I didn't just randomly decide to make a video about Steffi Cohen's six pack. That would be weird, even for me. Steffi made a video about this topic very recently. The most effective way to get six pack abs. And yes, I stole a part of her thumbnail again. Steffi's looking like a Greek statue over there. I'm looking like E.T. Life goal achieved. And there are issues that I want to raise with this community from watching her video. So stop wasting my time and let's begin. An entire generation has grown up chasing that ideal six pack ab look that we see in movies and in our fitness heroes. And then an entire six pack industry sprung up around it. The global fitness industry is valued at over $100 billion. A significant slice of that pie is made up of a group of workout videos waist trainers, crunch contraptions, and core blaster extremes, all designed to target one muscle group above all else. We call those the six pack secret products. Welcome to the let's have a chat playlist, how nice is that? Where I raise topics for discussion with this community and I also slip in a bit of exercise science. The six pack has without doubt been marketed as the image of fitness for decades. It sells products and services. It also sells classic musical offerings. But is being that lean a genuine reflection of fitness? And for training your abs, what about crunches? Are they a good or bad idea as an exercise selection? For the answers, I will be referring to Tyra and the Fitness Addict. The only thing you have is saggy man boobs. Comedically glorious. Saggy man boobs. Nothing can substitute a solid training plan and a good diet. As a society, we are obsessed with sculpted abs. They aren't gendered. Men and women both try to melt fat off their stomachs just as hard. And so Steffi raises some important points in her videos and is correct with the statements she makes. She doesn't say anything incorrect. Perhaps she only scratches the surface with some of the issues. And so what I'm gonna do is add an evidence-based communication, citing a paper from Contreras and Schoenfeld, the glute guy and the muscle professor team up. There is a joke in there somewhere, but I forgot it. Consummate professional right here. And it is worth noting that Steffi has a coaching program which she talks about at the end of the video. So I'm sure in that program there is in-depth program a six pack is a very specific goal and it requires a relatively low amount of body fat to achieve it. Work towards reducing body fat and improving lean muscle mass in general and the abs will follow. Number two, it's an old cliche that abs are made in the kitchen and that is absolutely true. And it's certainly not the goal for everyone. However, if you're not training for the extreme goal of an aesthetic six pack, you will still be training your abs as part of a balanced exercise program. And so therefore the information that I'm gonna give in this video really is applicable for everyone. So what the heck do we need to do instead? First, acknowledge that people are different. Some people look leaner with different amounts of body fat. We do also need to consider this on a spectrum. For example, there are chemicals under the counter, illegal chemicals, which absolutely can shred fat to help get towards that six pack. And that's not something that I recommend at all on this channel, but something that I do need to project as a start to this video. Sometimes it's easier for people to get a six pack instead of chasing some unrealistic, Hollywood-inspired, often fictionalized ideal, focus on improving yourself. Focus on yourself, your journey. And so most importantly, we all have different goals with our health and fitness. The fitness industry is very tribal, in my opinion, where these extreme goals, for example, the aesthetic six pack, are projected commonly as what fitness is. Whereas goals such as longevity, endurance, mobility, perhaps cross training, becoming competent with multiple disciplines, nowhere near as projected as the extreme aesthetic. And those goals, of course, are absolutely fine. And those people deserve a great amount of admiration for the discipline and the work they put in, but they do not represent present the wider scope of what health and fitness really is and how each person's journey is different and how each person's goals are different as we all have unique characteristics and needs. And so I've been very lean in the past. It ain't for me. I had a bony backside and I need some padding when I sit down. Did I just say that out loud? Is this now as awkward for you as it is for me? So Steffi starts by debunking some fitness gadgets. Right up my alley, let's deadpan this. This is just saved by the bell. You got lucky, Slater. Number four on the list, the ab lounge. Imagine rocking up to the beach, laying down your towel, getting out your bucket and spade, ready to build your sandcastle, and this turns up next to you. Talk about flexing on people. Abs aren't as easy connected with bulkiness, or there isn't as much fear that if you accidentally work them too hard, your abs are gonna look too good. 
that vanilla unopinionated quality makes the apps an easy target for overselling and flagrant misinformation. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is amazing. That's what she said. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Literally, that's what she said. After having your stuff gyrating around on their chairs all day, imagine what the toilets look like in those office blocks. F***ing chaos, I would imagine. So the six pack machines that get you ripped in a short amount of time are of course very misleading. And I have a video about the six pack hacks where I talk about products, creams, and people. Stay active throughout the day, eat a balanced, satiating diet, approximately equal to slightly less than what you burn in a day. And if you consistently do this, your body fat will go down. Just practice a little patience. Number three, some people get the idea that abs are just about reducing body fat, but abs are muscles too. So it's a good idea to train them. You don't have to do endless crunches. Many of the most common movements in the gym, like squats and deadlifts, challenge and hypertrophy your core muscles as well. And so this is where I want to pick up on the issue of crunches. And I want to project an article to you from Schoenfeld and Contreras, two very intelligent thinkers into fitness who have a lot to offer. Dr. Schoenfeld, again, with the arms folded pose, I think it would just be funny, just for one research paper, if he did the dirt off my shoulder pose. And so I'm not telling you to do crunches or to not do crunches. This is analytical. Again, your programming is down to you. But for example, if you have a history of back injury, then doing crunches may not be a good idea. That's an example of critical thinking into this topic. To crunch or not to crunch. If we're talking crisps in the cinema, not to crunch. You bastards. And so the basis of the article is that many fitness professionals are advising that you do not do crunches. Concerns are usually predicated on the belief that the spine has a finite number of bending cycles and that exceeding this limit will hasten the onset of disc damage. And so this is an in-depth paper where they looked at research into crunches and they referenced 147 papers and it was analytical in nature. They looked at the potential benefits of crunches and the potential disadvantages of crunches. And this is what they concluded from their analysis. Taking all factors into account, it would seem that dynamic spinal flexion exercise provide a favorable risk to reward ratio, provided that trainees have no existing spinal injuries or associated contraindications, such as disc herniation, disc prolapse, and or flexion intolerance. And so here are the practical applications that the researchers communicated after taking an overview of the research into this topic. Given that the spine and core musculature are loaded during non-machine based exercise performance, such as during deadlifts, squats, chin-ups, and push-ups, most training can be considered core training. Therefore, it is best to err on the side of caution and limit the amount of lumbar flexion exercise to ensure that the tissue remains in eustress and does not become distressed. If you don't know what the word distress means, listening to David Hasselhoff singing Sweet Caroline would suffice. Based on the current data, the authors recommend that a sound core strengthening routine should not exceed approximately 60 repetitions of lumbar flexion cycles per training session. Untrained individuals should begin with a substantially lower volume. A conservative estimate would be start with two sets of 15 reps and gradually build up tolerance over time. Taking all factors into account, a minimum of 48 hours should be a between dynamic spinal flexion exercise sessions. Almost there, stay with me, and here is the conclusion. The claim that dynamic flexion exercises are injurious to the spine in otherwise healthy individuals remains highly speculative and is based largely on the extrapolation of in vitro animal data that is of questionable relevance to in vivo human spinal biomechanics. I for one want to see the study where rats do sit-ups. No evidence exists that a low volume strength-based exercise routine that includes dynamic spinal flexion movements will hasten the onset of disc degeneration. And so essentially they're saying that if you do not have injury, you can of course do crunches, but that you're also getting work on your core through regular exercises such as squats, for example. And so you have to be selective with how you put the crunches into your session. I'm James Linker, this is Shredded Sports Science. Thank you so much for watching the videos, for interacting, for the continued support. I appreciate it greatly. I'll see you soon.